So I thought for my next video I'd pull together a simple uh, GPS disciplined alarm clock using uh, again the uh, STM 32F4 as micro controller and you can see I've uh, kind of started to build it up here. Um, as for features I'm thinking of the following so 12 and 24 uh, hour display, uh, GPS correct corrected or, or even GPS driven. Uh, the GPS uh, protocol does come with a uh, a UTC time in it, um, which obviously I would need to convert to local time. And then periodic lat uh, longitude and latitude display. Uh, obviously the alarm as we talked about, um, not sure uh, whether I'll use a kind of a sound device or just use PD PWM from the, uh, from the microcontroller, we'll see. Uh, old style LED display, and you can see that's uh, flashing away here in the middle. Uh, I actually turned down the refresh rate a bit because it was uh, kind of nauseating. Um, certainly on camera. We'll get to that uh, uh, 12 volt powered battery backup potentially. Uh, and then some of the constituent products that I'm going to use to build that up are obviously we talked about the microcontroller. Um, this is the STM 32F401. Um, uh, an LED display sort of for that old time uh, look. Uh, and this is a uh, six, uh, uh, six piece uh, common anode seven segment uh, LED display here. And there also is a decimal point here. So it's seven segments plus decimal point. Um, for GPS, uh, I, I've actually ordered a uh, GPS uh, off Banggood, just one of their cheap uh, $6 ones. Um, but uh, to start with, I'll be using the QRP Labs QLG one just to get me going while I'm while I'm waiting for that to arrive. Uh, so that's for GPS. Actually, uh, oh, we'll walk through the QRP Labs circuit a little later. It's a completely self-contained uh, uh, GP, uh, GPS unit. Um, so some of the things I'm probably not going to get to in this is um, obviously you can compute the uh, the um, uh, the time zone from your latitude and longitude. Uh, there are databases out there. Uh, I probably won't be doing that. Um, I'll, I'll 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 see. I've I've downloaded the code. The code's not a big deal. Uh, the databases are somewhat large and and probably too large to put on the STM thirty two F four. Now, there are APIs actually available. Uh, so if this was connected to, uh, if I could connect this to by wireless to, to the internet, then it could certainly look at the databases online. But obviously, it's, if it's connected to the internet, it can just use NTP to get the time. We don't need GP, GPS. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's that. Um, I also, uh, the, the, the other complexity in time is computing whether you're in uh, daylight saving time or not. And I'd probably, uh, I'll think about that. I, I, we probably won't get to that either. But anyway, um, that should be enough features to have a bit of fun. So we'll get to have a play around with uh, LEDs and how you drive, how you drive those. Uh, we'll get to play, play around with the GPS uh, um, uh, syntax. Uh, and also, uh, I mean, this is, uh, the, the, what you're seeing here is just driving this sort of the, sort of bare metal. Um, there are driver ICs. Uh, the Max, uh, I think it's 7 to 19 is one, for example. I'll also demonstrate how you drive that. I mean, uh, using the driver ICs is much simpler than, than, than what you see here. You just drive it using an, an SPI style of interface. But anyway, that's what I thought I'd do with this video. Um, we'll uh, move straight on now to... Um, uh, to driving the LEDs and uh, we'll take it from there. So let's start with a common anode LED and uh, I've got an example here. Uh, I'm guessing this is around about 1990s vintage. Uh, the LED itself is a little bit dim. Uh, but anyway, let's have a look at its internal construction. So just on the uh, on the LED itself, so this being a common anode, basically the common connections here are these two VCC pins here. So you apply voltage either here in the, at the middle pin or here at the middle pin. And then each of these segments is grounded if you want to turn it on. Now, obviously, it, you usually ground it through a resistor because you want, to con you want to make sure you control the current through the LED. So basically, you supply power here and then you ground whichever one of these segments that uh, you want to turn on. So just looking from the top of the, um, let's just move over here a little bit. So this is looking from the top of the um, uh, of the uh, digit here, and you can see this is the pinout. So VCC is the uh, the uh, top 
middle and top and bottom middle pins. And then the segments uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G correspond to these segments here. So let me just zoom out a little bit. There we go. So here's the segments here, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And here's where they correspond to on the uh, on the LED itself. And as I said, common anode, you, you supply v VCC and then ground the pin. Common cathode is you basically, this is ground, and then you supply voltage to whichever pin you want to turn on. So the key question uh, really is, given this uh, this board layout, you only have the, uh, the digits and then uh, whichever uh, digit that you want to turn on, how do you actually control this? As you can see on this board, there's no, there's no driver IC on this board. It's just basically you have one, two, three, which, which corresponds to the, uh, let me just zoom in a little bit on that. So you have one, two, three, which corresponds to, this is first digit, second digit, third digit, fourth digit, uh, fifth and sixth. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six here, and then you have a pin for each of the segments. So how do you actually control this? Well, the answer is multiplexing. So essentially what the microcontroller is doing is strobing through each one of these digits in turn, one, two, three, four, five, six. With each cycle of the digit, it turns off or on the appropriate segment, and then it moves on to the next digit. So this digit is displayed, then this digit is turned off, then this digit is displayed, and so on and so forth. And then human eye persistence takes over. So before we see that uh, in action, let's just quickly go through the uh, microcontroller setup here. So microcontroller's off to, the, off to the left here, and there's two sets of pins on the microcontroller. There's a set of pins that select the specific digit that I want to display, and then there's a separate set of pins that select the segments that need to be displayed for that, uh, for that given digit. So driving the, the actual digit display is done through this PNP uh, transistor here. And I keep that external to the, uh, to the microcontroller because the current flowing through here is basically going to be the sum of all the currents flowing through the, uh, through the, uh, the, the segments. Each segment consumes around about 5 to 10 milliamps of current. Uh, so the sum of those, so let's say I'm displaying 8 with a decimal point, that's going to be 8 times 5 or 40 milliamps, which is greater than the 20 to 25 milliamps maximum that you, uh, that you can sink into any one of these pins. So you can see this in action, obviously greatly slowed down here. Um, I'm basically changing this every t uh, every tenth of a second. So you can see it starts at this digit, sets the uh, sets the appropriate segments of the digit, and then uh, and then turns this digit on, then this digit on, and this digit on, and so forth. So obviously, as you reduce that delay, and I'll just uh, reduce that delay to a thousandth of a second bet between each one, you'll see that, and, and this is where it gets tricky. Uh, now, obviously, uh, my phone doesn't have the same eye persistence that, uh, that a human has, but you can see there it's flashing so quickly that it looks like all the segments uh, are actually turned on in this case. As you can see here, the strobing is done with, these, with this digit selector. So firstly, digit one is enabled. And then at the same time, I turn off and on, or sorry, ground and uh, 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 the, the particular segments that I want to display on here. And then the cycle continues with the, with the next uh, pin. So let's just uh, go over to the code and we'll have a quick look at that. Okay, so here's the code here in the, uh, uh, in the main loop uh, of the STM32F4. And as you can see, it's really, it really is quite simple. So basically... Uh, I call this display function. Uh, I have a display number and a current index, and the current index is basically the digit which is currently lit. So I uh, simply iterate through this, um, and then if the um, uh, if if a second has 
elapsed, then I have update the display number. So obviously a clock needs to be more complicated than that. But this this just gets by uh, while we're uh, while we're playing through this. And then if I go down through the code here, you can see the display code is really quite simple. So I pass in the number to to be displayed. So it starts out as one two three four five six, and then this index is the thing that gets updated every uh, yeah, every refresh, refresh interval. So the first thing I do is I look up, uh, basically this extracts uh, what digit you're interested in. So if it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, and the index is zero, then it'll, it would be six. Um, I then follow up that by turning all the LED uh, uh, digits off uh, by setting the uh, pins, uh, all these pins high. And then I pick out which is the index I want to turn on. So that's what this code here does. So basically, if the index is, is zero, then it would pick uh, GPIOC, and that would be uh, GPIOC pin zero. Um, and then the final thing is, and I, I did get this feedback in the, in the last video, is um, there always is capabilities to write to m more than one pin at the same time. So this is how you do it on the um, uh, on the STM thirty two F fours. Um, this is the output data register for port A, and basically what I'm doing here is the output data register for port A. Uh, I have all the uh, LED segments basically on from port uh, from pin. A0 through to A7, and where you have it like that, that's where it's ideal for uh, kind of setting them all as uh, one big group. Uh, in, in this upper part here, I don't have that. I have it distributed across the, the these various pins here. So basically here, what I do is, uh, the this is the output data register, uh, and it's actually a read and write register, so you can sort of interrogate it, see what's in it, and then set accordingly. So the first thing I do is I mask off the... Uh, the top uh, the top eight bits. I don't want to change those at all. So I basically and the output data register with the uh, FF00. So that preserves the upper eight bits. And then I uh, basically or the lower uh, eight bits with the digit I want to display. And you can see up here, I've got those. Uh, here's the uh, basically the uh, the digits from. Uh, Starting at one, uh, starting at zero, sorry, and going up to uh, up to nine. Uh, so these are the so, so the binary binary encoding of these digits. So each of these bits corresponds to a segment. So anyway, that's the code. Pretty straightforward. Um, what we'll move on to next is uh, is uh, hooking up the GPS and interrogating it. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be using this uh, QRP Labs uh, GPS kit. Um, while I'm waiting for the for the simple GPS uh, receiver to arrive, um, so I believe they've uh, they don't sell this particular kit anymore. They've upgraded to a QLG2, uh, which isn't uh, I think should be released very shortly. But anyway, I'll include a link to that. So um, let's just have a quick look at the board here. Um, obviously, the, there's two main components uh, to receiving a GPS signal: is the antenna, which you can see on the right here. And then there's the uh, RF module, which you can see on the left there. So the, the RF module does all the sort of heavy lifting to turn the GPS signals that it receives from the satellites um, into basically a, uh, um, a serial uh, interface that you can then tap off with your uh, microcontroller. So the GPS um, antenna actually gets installed on the reverse of the board. Uh, there's a, actually a little uh, there's a, a pin in the middle of the uh, of the GPS receiver and it uh, it plugs in right there. Let's have a look a quick look at the uh, schematic for this. Uh, bear with. I've just got to scroll up, get rid of uh, some nonsense on the screen here. More nonsense. My apologies. So let's have a look at the uh, the schematic and and what I'll be using here. So. The intent of the uh, of the QRP Labs uh, GPS receiver is uh, it's used uh, in conjunction with the radios that they sell. So there's a lot of circuitry here which is uh, dedicated to sh uh, doing level shifting. So all these ICs here level shift between 3.3 volts that the RF module emits and the 5 volts which the uh, which the QRP Labs radio uh, does. So I don't actually need any of that. So I can I, I can get away with not using these ICs here. 
Um, these ICs down here, so he, these are the this is the RX and TX lines here that you get from the uh, RF RF module. So along which uh, uh, travels these the, G, the GPS uh, serial interface, which we'll talk about a, in in a little bit of time. Um, and then down here we've got some other ICs here, and they're, they're, that their only duty is to sort of turn these LEDs off and on as signals appear. So. Really, I don't need any of this. I don't have to do, this is already 3.3 volts. I don't need to do any level shifting uh, for the STM32 F4. So what I will do is um, I'll install the 3.3 uh, volt vo voltage supply because it's kind of convenient to have that there. I'll feed it five volts and then I will tap off uh, the TX, RX and PPS lines uh, and we'll uh, put those up on the oscilloscope and, and check that out first. Um, uh, the only other thing to note on here is the is the kit also comes with um, a three volt uh, lithium ion battery, and that's used. Um, it gets recharged during use, and there's two voltage interfaces to the to the RF module. Uh, one is VBAT, uh, which you power the battery, and that provides uh, sort of it keeps uh, various configuration data in uh, in the memory of the RF module, and it allows for a far faster startup time. Subsequently, um, you don't really need the R the uh, lithium ion battery here for the for this thing to work. So I'll probably exclude this part of the um, the circuit too, and then we'll get down to the bare bones of just the RF module. Um, what else, what, else, what else to note here? The, the only other thing to note is that th this is the primary RF in line. And then there's an optional um, RF VCC line that you have here if you're using an active antenna. So you can, you know, it, it will actually emit a DC bias that an active antenna would, would use. But this actually isn't an active antenna, so that line isn't needed either. So anyway, what I'll do is I'll build up uh, this portion here, the 3.3 uh, volt power su supply here. Uh, we'll hook it all up, power it with 5 volts, and uh, we'll see if we can see some uh, GPS output. All right, so I've uh, basically pulled that together. Uh, as I said, I've emitted all this portion here, and then I'm tapping off, and uh, I'll move over to the uh, the PCB in a bit. But the TXD line is the yellow line. Uh, I haven't uh, got anything uh, coming from the RXD. I don't actually need to send anything to the RF module. And then I've got a green wire against this uh, this PPS. Uh, you'll get a pulse per second, one pulse per second, uh, when the GPS is locked onto the satellites. So let's move over to the uh, board and see that. Here's the board here. Here you can see the uh, partially populated uh, GPS board here. And there's that yellow wire coming from the TX of the RF module. And that goes into the, uh, the USART 6 of the... Um, of the uh, sorry, I'm shivering here. It's kind of cold out in the in the garage. Uh, US, it goes into USART six of the STM board. Uh, the, here's the green wire, which is PPS, and I'm not tapping uh, off that at the moment. And then I'm simply powering the board from from five volts. So let's turn that on, get that going. Uh, bear with. Just got to plug it in, turn it on. Here we are back on the laptop, and I'm actually going to send the output to a putty session here. So I basically got the USART 1 uh, coming out to uh, my laptop here. So let me fire that off. And here you can actually see the uh, output from the GPS. So, so basically just to trace that through again, the GPS module is sending to uh, the USART on the STM32. I'm just sucking that into the STM32, and then I'm sending that out uh, via the FTDI chip, uh, the FTDI board, back to the uh, to the laptop here, and you can see the uh, GPS signal coming through here. Now, when you first start up a GPS thing, the first thing uh, it'll do is look for satellites, and so that's what it's doing right now is basically looking for satellites, and depending on where you are, that can take anywhere from between 30 seconds to 10 minutes to I can't get a lock at all. Um, and so what we'll do, what I'll do is I'll suspend this now and then we'll come back when it actually has a lock. And uh, so that'll be around about five minutes or so, but I won't, uh, I won't keep you waiting for that. 
Okay, so let's uh, take a look at some of the output from the uh, GPS receiver just to see it um, uh, when it hasn't got a lock, which is what, what's up the top here, and then when it has got a lock. Um, so as you can see, uh, here's the, the set of messages, and I'll go through these in a bit more detail, GPGGA, GPGLL, and you can see in the when it doesn't have a lock, basically there's no position information returned, and there's no uh, satellites information returned either. So this is the message GPGSV, and we'll go at this into uh, more detail, but this is the number of GPS satellites in view. And uh, you can see here that the number of satellites in view is actually, uh, let me see, three, da, 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 there's actually zero satellites in view here. So anyway, um, let's, uh, uh, as I said, uh, I started this off and after about five minutes, it came back with a lock. And here's a sample series of messages here. And uh, uh, just a quick note, these, these GPS coordinates, I have mucked with these, so you don't uh, get an actual fix on my garage, but, uh, but anyway. Um, so let's just go through through some of the messages here. So the first one we see is GPGGA, and GPGGA is the uh, GPS fix and undulation message. And I'm getting the data from all this, and I'll provide a link to this from this uh, Novatel site here, which goes through all the uh, GNSS log information here. So you can see it uh, has details on all the different types of uh, messages you get off the GPS receiver. Uh, so here's GPGGA here, and it describes the message, gives you an example, and then it uh, describes the message in detail. So I'll provide a link to this site uh, for anyone who's interested. But let's just move, move back to the message so we, can, so we can see that in detail here. Um, so obviously the first thing of interest to us is this uh, UTC time here. So this is uh, hour, hour, minute, minute, second, second, and, and then uh, uh, thousands of seconds. Now, with this GPS receiver, I'm not receiving any thousands of seconds information. So basically, this is accurate to within plus or minus a second, which is certainly more than good enough for the, uh, for the uh, clock that I'm building. So obviously, if I'm building a, a, a clock, uh, UTC time's not much use to many people. I'm going to have to do some uh, time zone conversion for that, uh, as well as uh, daylight saving conversion that I mentioned before. There's a few toolkits uh, online to, to handle that, but uh, we'll get to that in more detail. But anyway, there's the, the time component. And you'll actually see the time com component appearing in some of the other messages too. So I can choose to either read the time from GPGGA or I could read it for one of these other messages. But let's keep let's keep marching down GPGGA. So the next two uh, uh, the next two components of the message are the latitude and longitude. And you can see here how to read this is this is the first two uh, of the uh, latitude are the degrees. So this is thirty three degrees, and then this is the minutes. So this is thirty three point two nine four five minutes. So I originally misread this as 33.33 degree, uh, degrees, it's not that, it's 33 degrees, 33.2945 minutes north. And then similarly with the longitude, uh, you know, there's an extra zero here because longitude can be uh, up, to, uh, up to 180. So this is 97 degrees, 44.7542 uh, minutes west. So pretty easy to read, pretty easy to parse those uh, those two. Um, and as I said, in this little clock, I'll probably end up displaying the um, the latitude and longitude just just for a bit of fun. Um, the next one is the quality uh, of of the uh, uh, of the message, and uh, have a look at that uh, Novatel link. It, it it has a quick guide to to what the quality is. Uh, this field is the number of satellites used in the fix. Uh, and that will be different to the number of satellites in the view, and you'll see that uh, as we get down to the following messages. The next, uh, the next figure is the horizontal dilution of precision, and this is basically a measure of how accurate uh, a fix uh, horizontally that uh, that the system has has calculated, and that's based on the sort of the orientation of the satellites, the, the quality of the signal, the number of satellites, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, I, I believe two is the theoretical, uh, the theoretical best that you can get out of this. But anyway, there's a lot of math and science behind GPS, which I probably won't go into here. The next um, um, uh, number in the sequence is the altitude above uh, sea level, uh, 163.8 meters we are here. Um, 
And then the following one is the undulation. Now, now what this is, is I did a bit of reading on this. It's, it's kind of a bit confusing for me. My, my understanding is this is the uh, deviation from the, uh, the so-called geo, geode or the, the mathematical model of the Earth for this point on the Earth. Uh, now, obviously, I'm not going to use that for my alarm clock, I'm, uh, but I thought it would be interesting to, in, to include it there. All right, so the next, uh, the next message that we have, have here is GPGLL. Uh, this is another geographic position message, um, and you can actually see the uh, latitude and longitude are repeated in this message as well as the UTC. So you can see I could either use GPGGA or GPGLL to, uh, to drive the clock. Next message here is uh, GPGSA, and this is a message that is specifically focused on the dilution of precision uh, and the number of active satellites in the, um, um, in the, it, 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 that we're receiving here. So you can see here, so the first, uh, the first one is uh, which mode we're in, and this is uh, automatic mode. The next mode is uh, it's either 3D or 2D fix. And we've got a 3D fix available here. So in other words, it's not just a latitude and longitude, but we actually have a, uh, a height above sea level um, figure as well. And then the following uh, up to, uh, I believe, 12 parameters here are the number of satellites used in the fix. And each one of these is a satellite identifier. So I can, uh, you can see here I've got uh, this fix is generated from GPS satellites uh, because any number less than 32 is a GPS satellite. Uh, GPS satellites 27, 30, 14, 28, 7, and 8. And then these final numbers are the dilution of precision numbers, a bit more detail. There's a vertical and horizontal dilution of precision here. Again, it's all about, well, how accurate is the fix? Moving down to the next message, and you can see this is a repeated message here, and this is actual details of the GPS satellites in view. So if you've seen um, a, lot of the, uh, a lot of these uh, software like Garmin and so on and so forth provides you a little sort of screen display of the satellites in view, well, it's this message that, that generates that. So, so what this is, it's a repeated message. This number here tells you how many distinct messages there are. So you can see here, we've got three distinct GPGSV messages. And then this number says, well, what, what is the ordinal number of this message? So this is the first message, the second message, and the third message. Obviously, that's included there, so you can easily parse how many message, GPGSV messages am I going to get, and which message is this one. And then we have repeating values for the satellites in view. So there are four values for each satellite that's, uh, that's in view here. Um, sorry, I'm... I'm, I'm doing the wrong one. This is the number of satellites in view. So 12 is the total number of satellites in view. And then we have a repeating four digits for each satellite. So the first number is the identifier of the satellite, the so-called PRN. The second uh, number here is the elevation of the satellite, the azimuth of the satellite. And then there's a measure of the signal to noise ratio of the signal coming from the satellite. So you can see here, this is the full message for that satellite. And then that's repeated, satellite 30, satellite 8, and so on and so forth. So this really allows you to sort of have a detailed understanding of uh, what uh, satellites that this GPS receiver can see and where are they in the sky. So the next message that we're going to uh, uh, look at is GPRMC. And this is the message that's used to determine your, uh, your, your uh, velocity and in what direction that you're heading. So obviously you can see that on those kind of mapping programs. It'll give you a little vector that shows your, uh, uh, you know, the direction that you're headed and the velocity that you're headed. You, that gets generated off this message here. And again, um, UTC time is repeated. This is a status indicating whether the, the, um, uh, the readings are actually valid or not. We have the latitude and longitude again repeated here um, for, a, a, as from before. And then we have a, a speed number here, uh, which in this case is 0 0.98 knots, um, which is, uh, I'm just reading here. So the speed in knots 
and then this is the direction that you're headed. Now, now obviously this was completely still, so you can see there's a there's a there's a margin of error here here. So it's a, it said I was moving at one knot effectively, uh, and this was my heading. Uh, obviously, it wasn't doing that because it was sitting on my bench. So you can see there's a there's a level of inaccuracy inaccuracy here uh, from the uh, from the signal. This is a, an interesting message here. This might be useful. As also, is this is actually the date and time, uh, the date. So uh, 17th of uh, February 2021. Um, so that might be useful in the alarm clock too. I, I don't know how reliable uh, this particular um, this particular date is. Um, so I'll have to I'll have to do a bit more digging on that. And then the final message, at least that's output from this receiver, is another message that describes in greater detail. Uh, the track and speed. So it's kind of similar to this message, but in this message, uh, you get the heading, which is uh, this figure here. So you can see it's the same as the one above. Um, and then you you get the speed in knots and the speed in kilometers per hour. Um, so that's just a little more detail on the uh, on your track and heading. So anyway, that's the details of the, um, at least for this receiver, other receivers will, will uh, you know, this is a very cheap receiver, so uh, other receivers will have more detailed messages or different messages. Uh, the order of the messages certainly isn't guaranteed, so that's all part of the parsing. Um, so obviously in this, you know, I'm going to pluck off the um, the time. That's the thing that's important to me. Um, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll create some code in there that does that parsing. Um, and then basically I'll update the code that I showed you before to show it setting the time. And the other thing that we're going to do is uh, obviously, um, you know, this is going to be this is going to be a sort of a clock. So I need to be able to, for the clock to work um, if it loses a, the GPS fix. So I don't want to just derive the time strictly from the uh, from the GPS signal. So what I'll do is I'll use the real time clock capability that's in this particular STM32. It's in it's in pretty much most of them. That F1, the F4. F7 and so forth. And what I'll do is I'll uh, set the real-time clock from the first GPS signal it gets, and then I'll just read that GPS signal periodically. Uh, the real-time clock on board the uh, STM32 is pretty accurate. Uh, I mean, obviously it, it will, like everything, it will drift. And, and so what I could do is basically set the real-time clock and then periodically, maybe once a minute, once every 10 minutes, update that clock from the GPS. So that's what I'll do next. Uh, and we'll come back and see the results of that. Okay, so the uh, the code's complete, and uh, let me just pan over to the uh, to the clock here. So uh, it is actually uh, GPS disciplined at the moment. Um, so that's UTC time there, seventeen hundred uh, forty nine minutes and sixteen seconds. Uh, so let's just uh, walk through some of the code, uh, and uh, let me show you what I did there. So just a couple of notes to start with. Uh, I, noticed, I noticed that I was using PC13. Um, uh, that's actually the anti-tamper port. I uh, was using a part of that. Um, there's a recommendation against using that for anything that uses anything more than a couple of milliamps. So I moved that over to PB9. Uh, just a note on setting up the, uh, the real-time clock. That is pretty straightforward, but just let me show you where that is in the, uh, the cube set up here. So basically you just go in uh, you enable the clock itself. So let me go into, um, bear with me, my, my apologies, I'm just going to move this down a little bit. Um, so you activate the clock source and you activate the calendar. Now, now these uh, aren't used, uh, but they are, um, they do get marked in error if you have PC13 in use at the moment. So as soon as I uh, move that over to PB9, um, all of these are fine, but I'm actually not using the alarms or the external calibration and so on and so forth. Um, just down onto the parameters for a quick sec. So the parameters that um, are in use here, and this is similar to the uh, the timers. You've got this uh, uh, asynchronous um, uh, prescaler and the synchronous prescaler. And basically, let's just go over to the clock configuration for a moment. Um, I'm using as the... Um, frequency source of the clock, this LSI, which is one of the internal lower frequency uh, oscillators, and that's 32 kilohertz. So what the clock needs is a, a one hertz signal, and that's where this um, pre-divider and pre-scaler come in, is this is effectively, like the timers, it's one less uh, 
So this is 128 and 250, and 128 times 250 is 32,000. Um, and that's what you need. You need to sort of scale it back to a one hertz uh, signal. Okay, so let's move into the code. And uh, the first function of interest is discipline clock, and that's uh, called uh, in the, while, the main while loop. And what its job basically is to do is to uh, look at uh, this GPS info, which is the shared GPS info um, that, the, that the program uses uh, that stores all the GPS information. So the first check to see is, is the clock actually disciplined right now? If the clock is disciplined, what I basically say is, all right, well, uh, wait, um, wait a minute and then only discipline the, uh, discipline the RTC once a minute. It kind of felt wrong to uh, be constantly disciplining the uh, real-time clock. Um, so anyway, uh, that's what I've decided there. I could have each, e equally disciplined the clock every time I have a valid GPS signal. So in terms of uh, determining a valid GPS signal, that's these lines of code here. Just make sure that I actually have parsed a, a signal correctly. Uh, and that the uh, timestamp that was recorded on that, uh, that GPS info is less than 200 milliseconds away. I don't want to be um, updating the real-time clock with a, a stale uh, signal. And then in here, this is where I populate the uh, real-time clock uh, struct with the hours, minutes, and seconds from GPS info. And then I call HAL RTC set time. Now, note uh, there's two formats uh, for HAL. Uh, for, for all the HAL RTC, there's the uh, binary ones, which is what I'm using here. And then there's binary coded decimal or BCD ones. Um, so anyway, as soon as I call HAL set time, uh, the real time clock is set. And then I mark the uh, GPS inflow with uh, a true for GPS. So it's GPS discipline now. And then I mark GPS info, the actual v GPS info itself as invalid because I don't want to be using this same, uh, I don't want to use, be using this same uh, record again to uh, discipline the clock. Okay then, so this is, uh, the, the clock is disciplined, so just moving to where it's displayed. So this is the display time function, and you can see here it's getting the, um, uh, the display uh, time off the real-time clock. So there's this set of function calls here, how RTC get time and it populates this struct with the current hours, minutes and seconds according to the uh, real time clock. Now one interesting little note here is you can't just call how RTC get time. You have to call both of these in a pair. And I've included a, 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 the note from the, the how libraries here that says you must call how RTC get date after how RTC get time otherwise and then it basically says you, you get invalid values. So uh, after uh, th that gets populated into uh, the S time struct here, I just uh, pull out the hours, minutes, and seconds, and then update the LED as I, as I showed you before. So that's uh, pretty much uh, all I want to do in this video. I'm going to break this into two parts. The video is going a bit long. I do have planned to uh, sort of create some um, setting alarm functionality and having a user interface so that you can set your... Uh, UTC offset and so on and so forth, uh, but I'll hold that off for the for the next video. Um, and uh, I'll probably um, what I'll probably do is uh, get into KiCad and uh, and create a, a, a schematic for what I've got set up here as well. Um, I mean, obviously it's, it it is pretty straightforward, but uh, it always helps to have a, a schematic for reference. So anyway, I'm going to wrap this for now. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. Stay tuned. Uh, I will do, create a part two where I kind of wrap up all the functionality to discuss uh, earlier on. So anyway, that's all for now.